Six o'clock and we will call to order the current council of government's transportation planning policy committee. And we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. Roll call, please. Present. Blades. Present. Couch. Here. Crichton. Here. Crump. Here. Davies. Here. Espinoza. Here. Cryer. Here. Uh, Navarro. Here. Para. Here. Uh, Reyna. Scribner, Bob Smith. I'm here. Vasquez, Warney. Here. We're good. Public comments. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons to address the committee on any matter not on this agenda but under the jurisdiction of the committee. Committee members may respond briefly to statements made or questions posed. They may ask a question for clarification, make a referral to staff for factual information, or request staff to report back to the committee at a later meeting. Speakers are limited to two minutes. Please state your name and address for the record prior to making a presentation. Are there any public comments? Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Tony Renteria. I'm the program manager for the current active transportation lance. Um, we have a quick video to show you all of the Mark City that we held at the Boys and Girls Club in Lamont. Okay. Um, so at the Boys and Girls Club, uh, it was it was a great turnout. Uh, we had about 30 kids. Um, it, it was it was wonderful. Again, teaching um, teaching the youth uh, about bike safety, um, normalizing riding bikes for everyday transportation. So it was great. <clears throat> also, uh, updating you all, uh, May 4th, we'll be kicking off Bike Month at Orangewood Elementary School, holding a mock city as well. We also will be having many more events in the month of May, including the Ride of Silence, May 15th, Bike to Work Day, May 17th, and commuter stands throughout communities in Bakersfield area. The commuter stand events are currently being developed, and all this information can be found on our website at bikebakersfield.org. Um, if anyone needs a bike for any of these events, you can contact us at bikebakersfield.org. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Tony. You want to show the video? You can found it. While she's looking, are there any other public comments? Okay. We have somebody online that wants to make a public comment from the PUC. Okay, here's our video. <laughs> yeah, so uh, just talking a little bit um, about our program and what we do. Um, this. Oh, is it? Is it down right there? 
couple days ago. Great. There it Thank is. you. Obvi obviously, I don't change my wardrobe up too much. Thank so. you. <laughs> Thank you, guys. I think we have a question for you. Oh, okay. Later. Okay, you're good. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. And now we have somebody from the PUC. And I've got an echo. Hello. Oh, let me turn my volume off. Got better. Is that better? Yes, we hear you now. Hello, my name is Heather Igomoro. I'm the local government and community liaison um, for the Central Valley, uh, Sierra Nevada and High Desert from the CPUC. So I just wanted to introduce myself and say hello. Um, the commission is not necessarily focused on regional transportation planning, but there's definitely some overlap. So I wanted to um, let you know that I'm here and uh, if you have any questions or or concerns on CPC related issues, please feel free to contact me. Um, Aaron and uh, Vicky have my contact information. Great, thank you. Any questions mm -hmm. for the speaker? Seeing none. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other public statements, Mr. Ion? Ion, I'm sorry, Ion. Yeah. I mean, this is just maybe for for Aaron or or our litigation as as being a representative from McFarland. Uh, is there any rules as far as a, having a, uh, other representatives attending the meetings or missing consecutive meetings where they need to have a replacement from their city and not showing up to the meetings? Or Mayor, you you can designate a. Uh any, rep any elected official from your city to come. Okay. Uh, and there, we do not have any rules in our bylaws about uh, members missing the meetings and, and uh, or missing consecutive meetings and, and not being able uh, to attend. Or, or just having the common courtesy to let you know. Okay, thank you. Thank you. 
Consent agenda opportunity for public comment. Mr. Chairman. Oh, I'm, uh, yeah, I skipped uh, presentation by Brian Gogi. Uh, hello, uh, members of the committee. Thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, speak with you this evening. Um, you should be able to see the presentation, it looks like. Uh, so I will just jump right in. Um, as uh, over the last uh, many years, uh, Godby Research has conducted a survey annually for uh, the current uh, Council of Governments. Uh, as you see here from the methodology, this is an online and a phone survey. The universe is likely, or is adult voter, adult residents, sorry, uh, 656,000 uh, in the county. Uh, we actually subsegment that into four areas in the detailed analysis, but uh, make sure it's representative. Uh, we also look at a variety of different uh, demographics as well. Uh, we were in the field in mid-January through the beginning of February. The average survey was 24 minutes long. Uh, the sample size that we completed was 1,227 uh, adult residents, again, uh, 18 plus. Uh, there were 309 cell phones, 135 landlines, and the majority is from the text or, or email invitation to the survey to the online version. So that's 733. Uh, 71 interviews were conducted in Spanish, and again, we weight the data based on the uh, census uh, American Community Survey. <clears throat> uh, the margin of error then, given all of that, uh, is plus or minus 2.8 percent. Moving into the findings, the first the question is satisfaction with the quality of life in the county. Uh, the top bar is the 2024 data, and when you add the very and somewhat satisfied together, you see we're at 66%, 66.3 to be specific. But as you look down these boxes with the percentages added up, that's the very and satisfied for each year. Uh, you can see that this is the highest it's been since 2019, so pre-COVID. So uh, what we've seen in a lot of different uh, agencies throughout the state is obviously the quality of life uh, went down during the pandemic. Uh, and now we're starting to see a rebound, which is certainly a good thing. <clears throat> the next question was their view of the future quality of life in their community. <clears throat> and again, adding the top two together, the much better and somewhat better, you see we're at 35% saying that uh, it will be better in the future. Uh, and again, if you scan down really quickly, you'll see that's the highest in all of the bars that we have here going back to 2019. And while it doesn't fit on the slide, in fact, it's the highest since 2017. Uh, so that too is an encouraging sign uh, about uh, things recovering since the pandemic. <clears throat> uh, the next set of questions were a little more open-ended and we asked people what they thought uh, were the features of their city or town or their community that they liked the best. Uh, and at the top of that list, we have a uh, small town atmosphere uh, and that's at 41.5%. That's the highest it's been in the last uh, four surveys. Uh, location was at 29%. Uh, that's sort of varied up and down a little bit over the last four years. Uh, cost of living is an item that people like, but has declined uh, since 2021. 20, uh, so in 2021, cost of living was a good saying people were saying it was a good thing by about 44 percent but that's now down to 28 percent in round numbers so there's still obviously some cost of living inflationary concerns uh, as that's not as high as it once was uh, sense of community is fourth at 27 percent that too is pretty much the same over the last four years cost of housing is still a, a positive at 26 percent but like the cost of living it is lower than it was back in 2021, where it was 39 percent. So there's still some uh, concern uh, related to housing and the cost of living in general. Uh, from there, we go on to a variety of other items, natural resources, farming and agriculture, weather and climate, uh, round out the top group of things people like about their city. <clears throat> 
Now, the next question was things they didn't like about their city, town, or community. Uh, and at the top of that list, you see is homelessness at 48%. So that's a pretty high number. It has been higher in the past. It was higher at 55% last year. Uh, and we saw it in that 55% range in a variety of communities in California. So that's not unusual, but certainly identifying a uh, challenge that um, the state faces. Uh, next was crime rate at 41% being concerned about that or identifying that as a feature they like least, then air quality problems at 36%, then gang violence at 29%, uh, lack of uh, community resources including hospitals and social services at 24 uh, cost of living was up a little bit as one of the things they didn't like uh, from the 21, about the same as last year, at 23%, uh, and then housing affordability, again, higher than 21, but a little bit lower than 20, uh, the 23 survey. Uh, job opportunities were uh, less likely to be a something they didn't like than back in uh, 2021, when it was about 30% were concerned about job opportunities. The crime rate uh, the next concerns are way down, huh? Uh, I'm sorry. The I crime didn't quite rate. Hear that. The crime rate concerns really dropped. Uh, they dropped, um, and it is statistically significant. In 21, it was uh, 40. It was 50 percent in round numbers, and it's down to 41 percent. And with that three or 2.8 three percent in round numbers, that is a statistically significant decline. In that, is something they don't like about their town. That's correct. <clears throat> Okay, so moving on, the next question said, this is a summary, this was a lot of detail, uh, and so uh, instead of uh, taking up too much time, we thought we would put it in a summary fashion. This was a whole series of issues that we asked. Uh, these are the top seven in terms of what are the most important issues for the next 20 years. The full report looks at all of them, of course, uh, as well as looking at all of them over time uh, in all the surveys we've done. Uh, improving the quality of public education is back to being the top issue for the next 20 years. Preserving water supply is second. Improving crime prevention and gang prevention programs is third. Uh, maintaining local streets and roads uh, is fourth. Uh, then improving water quality, uh, creating more high paying jobs and improving local health care and social services. <clears throat> The next question asked people what their primary mode choice was for getting to work or school. Uh, and uh, as we've seen it in many previous years, uh, drive alone is the, by far and away the top choice. It was almost 73% in this current year. That's a little bit higher than in the last two uh, and just a tad higher even than uh, 21 and 2020. Um, but statistically speaking, we're really just about tied. Um, it's still obviously the most important uh, mode choice that people make. Uh, not working retired is certainly an option since we were asking all of the population. So about 11% fall into the retired category. Uh, carpools are up slightly uh, in this uh, last most recent survey at almost 11%. Uh, telecommuting is actually pretty stable in the last three years, but it's down from the high of 2021 when obviously the pandemic was at its apex. Uh, so that's probably not surprising, uh, but it's not a gigantic amount. Uh, 8.5 in 2021 versus 5.4 again this time around. Uh, walking uh, was at 5% in round numbers and it was 5% in the last two years in round numbers, a little lower before that. Um, traditional express bus service at 4% and Uber Lyft at 3.4. <clears throat> now we had a follow up couple questions which were would you consider riding a scooter or e-bike as your primary mode of transportation? So this is asked of the commuters. It's not of the entire population because there's a chunk that obviously told us they're retired. Uh, so of those people that aren't retired, 23% said that they would consider that little bit lower than in 23, 
uh, or 22, but statistically, it's really there's no no difference from year to year. <clears throat> uh, we then asked the same group if they would consider riding a scooter or e-bike as part of another mode of transportation, and a higher number, uh, but again, still fairly stable number of across uh, the last three years of the survey. Uh, with not much change, a little bit higher in 22 than down in uh, 23 and up a little bit again in 24. But again, thinking about that 3% margin of error, uh, these are all within that, the statistical tolerances. Uh, the next question asked um, everybody again who hasn't already told us they were retired, if they would consider, if they telecommute or work from home currently, and of that, people that aren't retired, about 19% of the population said that they do telecommute currently. That's a little bit lower than it was last year when we started asking this question specifically. Uh, but it's not, not really, again, statistically significant. It's a less than a full percent difference from uh, 23. Uh, we then followed up with those people who said they were telecommuting and we asked them how many days a week they're telecommuting and you see from the kind of light blue bar that's the five days a week 32 percent of the people that are telecommuting are, are doing it five days a week basically uh, there's a few more uh, in the six days and seven days so that's another 17 or 18 percent so that's a pretty big chunk of the telecommuter, the current telecommuters that are doing it at least five days a week. Uh, the next question asked that same group of telecommuters, what was the most important reason to continue uh, telecommuting? And the green bars are the uh, largest this time around, and that is the, my company requires me to work from home. That's 29% in round numbers of those telecommuters. Uh, the blue bar is uh, to save dollars, that's 18%. The uh, sort of uh, tan bar is save time at 14% of the telecommuters. Uh, the burgundy is 9%, that's save gas. Uh, and the light blue is to uh, save the environment, prevent climate change. Uh, and then we've got um, sing low single digit numbers beyond that. And that's a little bit different than it was in 23. Certainly, the my company is requiring me is the big jump. The others are a little more uh, this close to the statistical um, margin of error. Now, the next question asked the people who were not telecommuters from uh, this question if they could telecommute, not if they were, but if they could. And so this is among uh, almost the entire population. It's 837 out of 1,200. Uh, so it's a really big chunk. And about 13% said that they could, in fact, telecommute five days a week. Um, and another 2% uh, in round numbers could do it six days, another 2% uh, is seven days. So you know we're looking at 17 or 18 percent in round numbers that could telecommute at least five days a week. Uh, in, and then in addition to that, there's smaller numbers that could do it one, two, three, or four days. Uh, the next question asked, again, this people who are not telecommuting, what the most important reason to start telecommuting would be. And the green bar here at the top uh, is saving money, so that's 20%. Uh, the, um, the blue bar is 19%, almost the same saving gas. Uh, and obviously, those are opposite sides of the same coin, but it's about almost 40% uh, of the population falls into one of those two categories. Uh, and then save time is the tan bar, and uh, my company requires it is the golden bar. And then for environmental reasons, is 8% the light blue bar. Those are roughly the same as they were in the previous survey. Not, no big changes there um, over the last year. <clears throat> the next question asked people about how to rate their um, city or town's traffic flow. Uh, and if you add these together, the top two, the excellent and good, green and the blue, you'll see we're at 38% in round numbers in 24. Mm -hmm. We were at 35% in 23. 
Uh, we were at the high water mark in uh, 22, where it was uh, almost 40% in round numbers. That was the best year in terms of their rating of their local traffic. In 21, we were at 38%, and in 20, we were at 35. Uh, we don't have uh, the data before that, but um, uh, it, it sort of makes sense that at the height of the pandemic, when people were driving less, uh, that's when people had the most favorable view of the traffic. Uh, in their community. Uh, switching gears a little bit, but still talking about traffic, this was a set of questions about increased commercial truck traffic over the last uh, three years. Now, this was asked of the entire sample and uh, a slim majority, so over half of the respondents said yes, they've noticed an increase in commercial truck traffic in the last three years. When we asked the people, uh, that had said yes, why they thought it was, uh, increase in sales and increase in demand was the top of the list at 20%. Uh, population increase and growth was number two at 16. Those are kind of tied in, in the top grouping. Uh, the next group is the next um, five items there, again, with that statistical margin of error, virtually tied, and that includes warehouses and additional distribution centers, new delivery pathing, freeway routing, uh, businesses and big business, uh, Amazon uh, or highway uh, reconstruction is next, uh, and then higher trucker uh, pay incentive for more trucks. So that grouping there is statistically tied. Uh, and then from there, we get into uh, lower numbers, e-commerce, Amazon specifically mentioned, obviously, a lot of, uh, uh, of traffic from there. And then um, COVID, uh, was it 1.1 or adapting from COVID. Uh, uh, next was uh, their opinion about uh, whether warehouses cause more commercial traffic, uh, truck traffic are, are worth the extra effort um, or if the jobs they create and construction and distribution jobs are better. Uh, only 14% said it really wasn't worth the cost um, of the additional traffic. And 46% said the new jobs in construction and distribution and increased sales and property tax revenues um, was worth the additional traffic. Uh, another 28% were sort of split, uh, so a little bit of both. Uh, and then 12% just didn't know. Uh, when asked, um, again, of the entire sample, if uh, commercial trucks should pay a higher vehicle registration fee, to offset road repair, again, a slim majority, this time 53% said yes, 34% uh, in round numbers said no, and 13% said don't know. And the next was a similar set of questions, but switch gears a little bit. This time we're talking about EVs, and it was, uh, which opinion do you agree with? Electric vehicles should receive a discounted registration fee and allowed to drive in HOV lanes to it provide an incentive. That was 23% agreed with that, uh, whereas just about 40% thought that electric vehicles should pay a higher registration fee to offset gas taxes and help repair our roads, um, but that electric vehicles aren't paying at the pump. Uh, so that's a pretty substantial plurality think that EVs should pay uh, an extra share. About 26% had mixed opinions and 12% here didn't know. Uh, of the people that this group here that thought EVs should get a discounted registration and be allowed to drive in the HOV lanes, we then asked them what their preference for replacing the gas tax that EVs aren't paying. Uh, and the top of the list at 11% was uh, an electric charging tax or an EV charging tax. Uh, then increase other taxes, which obviously is kind of part and parcel of the first one. So there's about uh, 18 per six, 17 percent in round numbers saying that some sort of tax. Uh, then car registration should go up. Uh, then uh, social living improvements, then road uh, improvements. Uh, these are sort of people guessing, I think, when it is we get into here. Uh, then there's another tax, um, uh, although not of the EVs, to tax gas companies, uh, and then a sales tax. Um, uh, would be another alternative. 
Jumping back to that mode choice that we had earlier on, for those people that did say that they drive alone, we asked them uh, what would be their most likely alternative. And remember, that was just a little over 70 percent. Uh, and of that group, 63 percent now say, no, nah, I'm still going to drive alone. Uh, of that group of people that their primary mode choice is driving alone, almost 20 percent would do a car or van pool. Uh, about 15%, uh, but a little bit lower than last year, said an electric vehicle. Uh, now, obviously, electric vehicle is still drive alone or could be, uh, but it seems to be an alternative, uh, at least in the respondents' minds. Uh, then telecommuting as an alternative was 12%, and a bike or electric e-bike would be another 11%. So at this point in the survey, we switched from transportation behavior and began to look at housing. First, we asked people what kind of house they live in. Uh, and again, you see the 24, 23, 22, 21, and 20 data. Uh, the current data is the Burgundy Bar. And so a little over a third, about 38%, said they live in a single family home with a small yard. Uh, about 44% said single family home with a large yard. 4% in a um, townhouse or condominium. Uh, almost none said that they live in a, a mixed use building of some sort. 11% said they live in an apartment and 3% didn't respond. Now the next question asked people what they would prefer to do uh, and not where they are living currently. So again, you see the last five years and in the current year, 34% uh, said that they would uh, definitely uh, pr prefer a single family home with a small yard. 36% said uh, the same thing. Uh, it said probably yes, sorry, uh, for the same uh, configuration. A single family home with a large yard was 54% saying definitely yes, and another 25% in round numbers saying probably yes. So the vast majority would prefer that single family home with a large yard. <clears throat> uh, when we look at the pre preference for a townhouse or condo, uh, the numbers go way down. The definitely yes is only 10. Uh, the probably yes is 28, but obviously that's nowhere near what we just saw for the, uh, the single family home with a large yard. In a mixed use building, uh, a little bit lower in total than the apartment or than the condos at 7 and 16, and then the apartments were at 10 and 17 uh, in terms of definitely and uh, probably yes in terms of their preference. Uh, the next slide just shows the interplay between the current usage, which is across the top. So here's the people that are in a single family small yard and what their preferences would be. Uh, a large portion of them, 81%, said definitely or probably yes um, to another small uh, yard family home. 73% uh, of those small yard folks said that they would like a larger yard. Uh, when you look at the people with a large yard currently, 87% said that they would like to stay with that. That would be their preference. When you look at the townhouse or condo people, 75% would go for a small yard. Uh, 79% would like to step up to the large yard, uh, but 91% at the end of the day said that they would continue living in a uh, townhome or a condo. The last two categories are pretty small, certainly the mixed use, so they don't really mean much. Uh, those that live in an apartment uh, would certainly love to live in a small uh, yard family home uh, or a large yard um, at uh, relatively high numbers as well. <clears throat> uh, the next question asked whether people would consider uh, living in a home that shares a lot with another house or living in a duplex. This is asked of everybody. 27% uh, of the current population said that they would consider that. It was 28% in round numbers last year and 35% percent the year before. So it's virtually the same as last year, but down a little bit from 2022. Uh, consider uh, building a second 
dwelling unit or converting their home to a duplex. So this is among homeowners. 28% said that they would consider doing that this year, and it was 27, and, and it's just the difference in the rounding rules. One rounds up, the other rounds down, so it's virtually the same. Back in 22, it was 28%, uh, so really not any difference over, uh, over time. And that is the data that we have for you this evening. I'm certainly happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Mr. Godby? I'm not seeing any, but I uh, I would say, you know, it's good news. Uh, have you seen uh, the positive trend in other jurisdictions? Is that kind of happening everywhere? Uh, yeah, it is. The sort of post-pandemic uh, positiveness coming back, both in terms of quality of life and their outlook. Yeah, it has been coming back. It's varied a little bit how strong it is, but it is certainly coming back. There's no question about that. What about the the worry about crime that dropped substantially here? Does that is that happening elsewhere or not? Um, I think it depends again where you are. If you're in an inner city, it's probably not the case. I did a, serve, a presentation uh, just earlier this week where it was actually up, uh, but it was inner city Bay Area. Uh, so. Um, you know, if you're in the suburbs um, or in the valley, I think it is getting a little better. Yeah. The the other the water, the 20 year outlook and and how water is. Seems to always be up pretty high. Is that. Something that's also seen in a lot of places or not. Um, it's not a question that we ask in a lot of places, um, obviously in. Um, in the Bay Area, it's not as much of an issue uh, to be asked. We have asked it in other Valley uh, counties. We've asked it in Stanislaus and San Joaquin, uh, and it, both water quality and water supply are issues. You know, anybody, particularly that relies on the Delta, that's an ongoing concern, uh, as those other two counties I mentioned do. Um, so I, I'm not surprised that it's a, an issue for you as well. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. I've got a real quick question over here. I have a question here. Yeah. I didn't, I don't know if I missed it or not, but did you put the, pose the question of, of those folks that would maybe try public transit? Uh, it was one of the options uh, in the mode choice for sure. Okay. Um, and remember that was a two part question. So, um, it uh, first we asked what their mode choice was, and I can scroll back to that really quickly. That's question six. So drive alone was 73%. Traditional express, uh, traditional bus service, express bus service, shuttle bus service. So that's the public transportation. Okay, uh, you posed oh, it that, that way. It's All a right. pretty small number, right? All right, thank uh, you. And, and the follow up question to that was um, let me see if I can hit that pretty quickly. Um, was asking the people that said they already drive alone what their alternative would be. And of the top, I mean, the carpool or van pool is a pretty prevalent alternative at 20%, but the others don't include the traditional public transit or one of those express bus services. The, the Uber numbers for the last three or four years, is that continuing to grow or it's kind of? It's been in this three, five percent range. So and it's staying. bounced around. You can see it's 3.4 this time. It was five last year, it was three the year before. So, you know, it, it's, um, it's, I would say it's around 3% on average um, uh, when we've, since we've been asking it. it, it's not, it's not growing dramatically by any stretch of the measure. In urban areas, is it growing more, or it's kind of fixed there also? Um, I would have to look at that. I do actually have the cross tabs open in the background here, so let me see if I can uh, find that quickly. There's only 2,600 pages of cross tabs, so um, <laughs> it shouldn't take long. take a little bit of a time, but let me see how fast I can go here. I 
question, I guess, that the follow-up question would be, you know, did it drop? Obviously, it dropped during the pandemic. Was it was it higher pre-pandemic, or it's kind of just back to where it was? Uh, so, you know, pre-pandemic uh, would be the best on this slide we have is 2020. So it's not quite, I mean, this was, when we do the surveys, it is in January, February. So in 2020, that was before the shutdown happened. So right. you could sort of think about that as pre-pandemic. That was 0. 0.6. Uh, it certainly is higher. Statistically, it's not significant, but it is certainly higher since the pandemic started, for sure, uh, numerically. But it, it, it's difficult to say that that's a statistically significant difference. Um, so I have found uh, question six. So let me see. Uh, so the first thing that comes out um, for Uber Lyft that I just happened to go to is by supervisorial district. Um, so when you look at the supervisor's district, in, in District 1, it's 4. In District 2, it's 4.8. In District 3, it was 3.1. In District 4, it was 3.1. And in District 5, it was 0. 0.6. So there's not a big difference there. Uh, let me see if I can find the central area, which obviously is Bakersfield. Um, Uh, jumping out at me here, uh, but we do have that data, so I could uh, yeah. look it up and provide it to staff, and they could get get it to you as well. Great, no problem. Any other questions? <clears throat> Seeing none, we'll move on. Thank you very much, Mr. Godby. All right, thank you. Appreciate your time. Next item is a consent agenda opportunity for public comment. All items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine and non-controversial by Kerncog staff and will be approved by one motion of no member of the council or public wishes to comment or ask questions. If comment or discussion is desired by anyone, the item will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered in the listed sequence with an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council concerning the item before action is taken. Does any member of the council wish to remove a consent item? Any member of the public? wish to remove a consent item seeing none can i have a motion motion crump second couch <coughs> roll call vote please i i own sorry i blades i couch yes Crichton. yes crump yes Davies. Yes. Espinoza. Yes. Cryer. Yes. Um. Oh, Carr. Yes. Para. Yes. Bob Smith. Yes. And Warney. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Caltrans report, District 6, Mr. Navarro. <laughs> Get to go first again. It's two months in a row. <laughs> All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, a couple things I want to cover for a project. So coming up is our annual Caltrans Worker Memorial. So I recognize the 191 Caltrans employees who lost their lives while working for the department. So um, in typical fashion, on April 25th, we'll have um, our statewide annual Workers Memorial at the Capitol Steps. And then in our District 6, we'll be holding one event um, in Visalia this year, essentially located in our district at the Visalia Maintenance Station. Um, Clean California update. So this weekend is Clean California Community Days, coinciding with Earth Day. So we do have a tire amnesty day at the uh, Vano Landfill here in Bakersfield. And then on April 27th, we'll be hosting a booth out at the Great American Cleanup. The I, I've talked in previous months about the corridor plan for State Route 99 that Caltrans is working on. Um, we are going to be kicking off our engagement activities uh, district-wide, actually valley-wide, uh, starting in June. So we plan on having virtual workshops in, in each of our counties here in District 6. So we'll be, we will be having one in Kern. So as that data approaches, we'll be reaching out and sharing that with 
um, vastly throughout Kern um, County, hoping for participation. As mentioned previously, we are looking at ways to manage the facility, looking at closing some of the gaps, looking at managed lane strategies, et cetera. So we want to make sure we're doing significant outreach with that action. Um, CAPTI, so the Climate Action Plan for Transportation Infrastructure, they're doing some listening sessions um, coming up here in, in our uh, sister districts, four and seven as well as six. So basically the Bay Area, Southern California, and Fresno. We were planning one in person in Fresno, but it looks like the registration numbers were low for the in-person option. So they're gonna have two virtual options um, on May 1st and May 2nd. So we'll be sending those out to you, you and your respective teams for uh, if there's any interest in participating in that. On the projects, so stay route 46, 43 intersection improvements. Uh, this is where we're installing a roundabout. That project still is currently in design. Uh, we're anticipating construction for spring of next year. The old US 99 to White Lane 99 rehab project, uh, we plan on wrapping that project here um, end of this month. So the final striping will be occurring and we're starting plant establishment for the landscape. In Delano, on State Route 155 between Fremont and West Browning Street, um, we're doing a rehab project that will include paving shoulders, uh, curb gutter improvements, sidewalk, class two bike lanes within the project limits. Um, you are coordinating with the railroads, so that does add a little added layer of complexity, but we also work with the city on coordinating this with some intersection improvements they're planning at, at State Route 155 in Lexington. Um, so that project should be ready to list uh, for advertising the summer of next year. Uh, State Route 46, the gap closure project known as Segment 4C. Uh, that construction is progressing this project. They're about halfway complete. Um, looking, we're still scheduled for completion in July of this year. Uh, just an update again on the California Aqueduct Project, Stay Route 166. This is a bridge rehab project. Um, that project will have a, a delay start as while well. they would pull permits from Department of Water Resources, and we're looking to um, start project uh, start the project in May of 2025, and that we'll have I believe about a six month closure um, of the bridge during construction. The uh, Pumpkin Center Rehab Project. This is Stay Route 119. That project is in a design right-of-way phase still. We're working through some right-of-way challenges, but hope to have those resolved by, by June of this year and then have that project ready to list and get that out for advertisement. The Morning Drive Rehab Project. This is on Stay Route 184 um, from just north of Edison Highway to uh, North Chase Avenue. Uh, I indicated last month that project was awarded to Griffith Construction. Um, that project will start construction this Sunday. Um, so there'll be some uh, impacts on the southbound direction. And then starting Monday, there will be a, a full closure on the segment of State Route 184 on the north end of the, of the project um, while they do some paving. And it'll be closed from s starting Monday, April 22nd to May 13th. So they'll have detours and signage up there. And just reminding that's a rehab project, but it does include several complete streets elements. And that actually last project, Arvin uh, Rehab Project. So that's another project where we're doing a rehab project, but we're incorporating a lot of complete streets elements like a, a hawk system, bulb outs, and RFBs. Um, that project is, is should be completing environmental work this month, and that project is scheduled to advertise in uh, fall of 2025. And with that, that completes my report. Thank you. I'm sorry I might have missed it. Did, did you mention Union Avenue, where we're at on that? I did not mention Union Avenue, but I think I have some information on Union Avenue. Yeah. So that, yeah, all I have is that project was, was awarded to Granite Construction. I don't have the exact start date listed right here. My notes of coming was awarded and we were to have a coordination meeting. Um, so it should be starting Great. here this uh, late spring, early summer. So I have a little more information, uh, Michael and Mr. Chairman. So the project again came in over over mm -hmm. uh, the estimate, but uh, Caltrans went to their headquarters and got the money. So they have the money in hand. Very good. And Caltrans was going to do some of the work. Yeah, we were going to absorb some of the work. I think it came in to Aaron's point like one point one million dollars over. And, and like I said, instead of trying to re-advertise again, we're we're going to take on some of that work. In Great. House. Appreciate it. Uh, District 9, we were going to have an introduction Thank first. Thank you so much. 
Thank you so much, Mr. Commissioner. Uh, Neil Peacock here, Caltrans District 9 uh, Planning Program Manager. Um, it was a great pleasure to be with you in person last month, and it's an even greater pleasure to introduce to you tonight the newest senior level member of the District 9 Planning Staff, Catherine Carr, who's in the room with you uh, right now. Uh, Catherine, you might know from her previous role as a regional planning liaison here with District 9. Catherine's a local resident of Eastern Kern County. She lives over in Bear Valley Springs and has a long history of working with the COG um, very closely. She was promoted to serve the role of our regional investment planning manager. The whole purpose of her role is to provide a more proactive and strategic approach to re regional funding partnerships, um, specifically um, for you all here, advancing uh, regional transportation priorities in Eastern Kern County. Um, with us, as always, we have Rick Franz and uh, your regional planning liaison who I've introduced previously, and Maggie Ritter, who's our regional planning branch chief. They're behind the scenes observing tonight. Um, and we're gonna go ahead and let Catherine uh, take her take a crack at reading our talking points in her new role as, as a senior here with uh, Caltrans District 9. Catherine? Thank you for the introduction and welcome, Catherine. Thank you, thank you. All right, I'm going to start with the projects. Uh, the uh, first one is the Rosamond ramp closures, and um, Kern County will be doing permit work on the ramps to Rosamond Boulevard from State Route 14. And that's where the connection is to Caltrans. The southbound off-ramp and the westbound on-ramp to southbound State Route 14 will be closed for a full-depth reconstruction starting at 7 on 7 p.m. on April 22nd, so next week, through 5 p.m. on April 26th, so all of next week. As they move forward through its project phases, uh, the southbound ramps will be impacted at Roseman Boulevard, uh, but we'll try, we'll keep you updated uh, to uh, communicate these closures. And as currently understood, the northbound ramps will not be impacted by this project. Uh, there's two uh, uh, maintenance and special crews buildings. Uh, let's see, the re remodel of the Mojave Special Crews Building has been, uh, for all intents, completed as of the end of uh, March. And then the Tehachapi Maintenance Station construction. Construction began in September, and it's ongoing. The estimated complete, completion date of this project is uh, February 28th, 2025, so a while out. And uh, if you want to hear the details of what they've been doing, you can ask. Uh, in PID outreach, there's two projects that we're, we're asking for public review of on the, uh, the PID or, or uh, PID phase. And I can, I'll put uh, links to these comment, uh, to the uh, story maps that explain these projects. I'll put them in the chat. Uh, the first one is State Route 202, the Cap M Golden Hills Complete Streets project. So the Complete Street portion is in the, uh, the part of 202, the, the sort of the straight way, and then the paving will go all the way down to the uh, CCI entrance. And uh, public uh, common period will end on April 22nd, so this Monday. The second uh, project for public comment is Attach Me Pavement Project. Uh, pavement running from, oh, between Keene and the 202 exit of uh, 58 all the way over to Sand Canyon. And again, that, the, the common period will end on Monday. Let's see. Oh, additional projects. The, uh, a 58 uh, boron rest area sewage system repair project that we described last meeting, it's now complete. Uh, Clean California, for us we have a tire recycling event both on May 4th and June 8th. And Caltrans will host a tire recycling event as part of the Clean California campaign at the Ridgecrest Boron Mojave Rosemond and Tehachapi Landfills. And if you want more information about these events, you can go to the District 9 website. Uh, also at this last CTC meeting, the Freeman Gulch Safety Project and the Rosemond Rehab Project, they went to the March CTC meeting and received an early allocation for the zero phase. So project management will be holding a kickoff meeting soon. And of course, more details to come. Here. 
of, so Michael mentioned the statewide fallen worker memorial ceremony that will be held in Sacramento. And the Caltrans ceremony will be hosted uh, at the Mojave Maintenance Station on May 2nd at 11 a.m. And this year's speakers include, uh, of course, our Caltrans District Deputy Director T of Maintenance and Operations, Tara Erwin, Tehachapi City Manager, Greg Garrett, uh, Kern Cog Member and Ridgecrest City Councilman, Kyle Blades, and CHP Lieutenant M Maria Pagano of Mojave. And we will also be uh, live streaming, streaming this event. And finally, just a reminder that the call for projects for the Cycle 7 ATP, or Active Transportation Program grants, open March 21st and 22nd. And uh, it is the deadline for submission for application is June 17th. So you still have some time to work on this grant. And that is all, if you have questions. Thank you. Any questions for District 9? Yes, you covered it all. Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome. Executive Director's Report. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and Board Members. I have a few items on this agenda. First, I'd like to again, uh, especially that he's here now, thank um, Mayor Ione for attending last month's CTC meeting. Um, their meetings now conflict with ours, unfortunately. A meeting was in San Jose, thanks to, uh, in part, to Mayor I own testimony. Our, all of our items were approved at the last CTC meeting. Um, we appreciate it. And um, the next CTC meeting is May 16th and 17th, and that will be a little bit closer to home in Orange County. I do plan on attending uh, the Friday portion of that meeting. Our meeting is on Thursday. Um, some of you ha have expressed interest. Please let me know if you want to attend. You know, need my permission, obviously, but if you want a carpool, you can uh, join me. Over the past, uh, oh, and one more thing, and thank you again, Mayor Ione, but the, the next CTC meeting, because of the extensive public comment at the March CTC meeting, they will now uh, start their meeting five hours earlier to uh, accommodate public comment, believe, mm -hmm. believe it or not, and mm -hmm. Mayor Ione can comment on that when when he has time or you can comment on it now if you if you'd like <laughs> no I, I stood for five hours i uh, never heard so much of uh, equality and well i'll leave that alone but i was uh what does that have to do with roads but yeah it was a long way but any, anything uh to get to give a good fight so Thank, thank you again. So o over the past month, we've continued to uh, meet and uh, confer with Caltrans and others about State Route 99 and State Route 58. In fact, um, this Monday coming up, I have a meeting with the chairman of the CTC, um, Mr. Carl Gardino, and Assemblymember Fong. And the meeting ha was arranged by Assemblymember Fong, who happens to be a friend of, of, of Carl. So I hope that will uh, pay dividends, and he will certainly be here. <coughs> and he mentioned to Mayor Ione that his favorite movie is McFarland. Yeah, he, he, yes, he did. And I think we, we need to make a tour down there, show him our infrastructure. Yeah, so, so the, McFarland, the signed McFarland poster that's in my office won't be there anymore after, uh, after I meet with Carl. I just want to add something real quick, Aaron. I want to thank your staff, Raquel and Rob and yourself for um, just basically teeing it off for me and worked out perfectly well. So other districts were happy. So thank you. Our, our pleasure. And, and uh, I, didn't, I haven't said this before, but Caltrans also appreciates you, you being there and backing them up. The, one of the, the main projects we were advocating for was something that we have very little involvement in. It's a Cal Caltrans-specific shop project that they were getting some heat from environmental groups on, and um, Mayor Ione uh, was there to s stand up for all of us. Even though the project is in middle of Bakersfield, Mayor of, of McFarland was there. Um, continue to talk about 204 Union Avenue. Just this morning, I, I spoke to a group about uh, Michael 
you know, the that what I hope are going to be improvements in the pedestrian and uh, bicycle fatalities as a result of your project. Seven, seven standard and 43, just this um, week we met about that, and that project involves a private company, wonderful, wonderful company. State Route 33, uh, safety improvements at the same CTC meeting, that project received additional funding. Um, Supervisor Couch and that project will now move move forward, and they're going to add four foot shoulders for the roughly 19 miles, which will save lives, no doubt about it. Um, earlier today, we met about State Route 46. Michael previously reported that they're on schedule to be done uh, this July, and as most of you know, that's been a 20-year-long process to widen uh, Route 46 in Kern County from Interstate 5 all the way to the San Luis Obispo County line. So sometime this summer, we'll be hosting a uh, significant ribbon cutting. may not be as big as, uh, as Centennial Corridor, but I, but I expect a crowd from both the, the Central Coast area and, uh, and the San Joaquin Valley to attend that. Truck climbing lanes on State Route 58 are on schedule. Uh, Michael and uh, Catherine, I'm glad to hear that District 6 is now actively helping District 9 deliver that project. That's good news. And of course, there continue to be meetings on State Route 119 um, in the what I'll call southern metropolitan Bakersfield area. They're actively um, conferring and meeting with Caltrans, so uh, 119 does not become uh, a Rosedale Highway. Subject to any of your questions, Mr. Chairman or board members, that concludes my report. Thank you. Any questions for the director? Seeing none, we'll adjourn that meeting and open the current Council of Governments meeting. Roll call is the same. Public comments are the same. Do we have any public comments? Seeing none, consent agenda opportunity for public comment. Any public comment on the consent agenda? Does any member wish to remove an item from the consent agenda? Second, Crump. Roll call vote, please. I own. Aye. Blades. Aye. Couch. Yes. Crichton. Yes. Crump. Yes. Davies. Yes. Espinoza. Here. Cryer. Yes. Bob Smith. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Executive Director's Report. Good evening again, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick reminder, I mentioned this last month. April 29th to May 1st, the San Joaquin Valley Policy Conference will be holding their annual conference at the Visalia Convention Center. I will be attending, as well as several um, staff members. Let me know if, if you're interested. In your folder this evening is a timeline covering April, May, and June, a um, list of community rides that was discussed uh, during public comment, another flyer related to the Kern Active Transportation Alliance, and a reminder, May is Bike Month. Current Council of Government Progress Report, April edition. And finally, uh, High Speed Rail was in town, I believe, last week. Met with some of you and some of your staff. They'll, they will be back in town on April 29th from 5 to 7 p.m. This is a flyer describing that meeting. Subject to any of your questions, Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report. Any questions for the director? Any member statements? Seeing none, this meeting is adjourned in memory of former board member Shirley Wakeman.